gives us free. Give us free. Your Honor, please instruct the defendant that he cannot disrupt these proceedings with such a Give us us free! If we are to have any symptoms of all this. Give us us free! Unity and welcome my conscious and unconscious family and friends. This is the all new Black Village Community Podcast, and I am truly your host of the show, JC, aka Afro Black, dropping nothing but the raw and uncut. Without any fear, as I use my mic as a spear to chuck a chuck of you with liberated truth, I am your host and your native soldier in the struggle. My purpose and mission for this show is first to enlighten, inform, and engage. And I want to engage with all who claim to know the truth. All truth seekers and my native family, I welcome you. This show is dedicated to all our indigenous native ancestors and to all those who've carried the mantle of truth and to every person with the ability to throw off the chains of comfortable habit and unwarranted assumption and move in a new, liberated direction that is guided by truth and observational evidence, no matter where that direction may lead you. My main objective and purpose here is freedom, mind, soul, and spirit. That being said, welcome to the Black Village Community Podcast and much love from our great universal goddess and mother of all living here and above. House. Aborigine, which means what? Black folks. When you never find a white aborigine. Hey, uh, rather, aborigines are called natives, or they're always dark skinned people. You and I are aborigines, but you don't like to be called an aborigine. You want to be called an American. <laughs> You go to a reservation, you see poverty, you see churches, and you see liquor stores. When you go to any hood, you see poverty, you see churches, and you see liquor stores. So what make you think you're not on a reservation? Right? So all these achievements that we ascribe to African Americans, these achievements by Native Americans who had to take on an identity of being African American because they was hanging up, because they was hanging up, because they was hanging up. This means, in the case of an American Negro, It comes as a great shock to discover that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians when you were rooting for Gary Cooper, that the Indians were you, that the Indians were you, that the Indians were you, that the Indians were you. But you think they was hanging people because they was Africans. Africans just want to go home. Nigga from here want to take his shit over. But you think they was hanging people because they was Africans. Africans just want to go home. Nigga from here want to take his shit over, take his shit over, his shit over, want to take his shit over. Take Our forefathers weren't the pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. 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 Graphs on the ground are all mounds found around the Americas, North, Central, and South. 
Mars, even Venus and Mars. That is documented fact that emanates from my mouth. So who exactly were these aboriginals here? Who they should never dance a residency that's accidentally mentioned in this hemisphere? Were they the stereotypical Native American so-called Red Indians? Well then, let's be clear. I'll skip the your their tribes if they're sincere. They'll tell ya, those mounds predate the origins. Our past was erased and replaced with lies. Our achievements and identity plagiarized. We got amnesia of who we are, but we go way back further than the seats in your car. Hey, 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 this is JC, aka Alpha Black, and I am here with you for another delicious Black Sunday to drop nothing but the raw and uncut here on the Black Village Community Podcast. And I am happy to be here this delicious Black Sunday to share with my conscious community and continue last week's podcast, which is titled, and I quote, The Invasion, oh, excuse me, The European Invasion and Transatlantic Myth. Again, uh, the European Invasion and Transatlantic Myth Part 2 We didn't land on Plymouth Rock Plymouth Rock landed on a subtitle And I'm going to continue this investigation and information About our indigenous history and past And continue to share with my conscious community And even those who are n- who maybe are just not sure and don't know and you know and and they're looking and searching for themselves and they're not there yet so i'm here to disseminate and to you know marinate this information with you so let me change up my lingo music and my theme music and give us something more easy to verberate to uh let me go there we go right there tribe called red you'll feel me that is a indigenous group and i love their music and that's why i have it looped in my backdrop as i you know, verbrate on this beautiful information and sometimes information that's not so beautiful, you feel me? But it's truth and that's what we need. That's what the that's what the black community need to learn to embrace. Truth. You feel me? But truth is a treasure. Truth is something you have to seek out. Truth is not gonna just walk up to you and introduce itself to you because truth is not ignorance. Truth is raw and uncut. You feel me? And that's what we talk about here on the black village community podcast you can always chime in it doesn't cost you a dime just a bit of your conscious time to chime in and join me here at the conference table of truth here on the black village community podcast you can chime in at 855-445-9340 you can also chime in at 857-232-0155 and don't forget the conference key to get to the conference dough to sit here with me and verberate on conscious truth which is 9475959 so I'm going to continue um, my subject matter from last week. Um, and uh, I got, you know, I, last week I said I was going to share some information that I didn't get a chance to, you know, verberate with on. You know, you know, I didn't get a chance to talk about, which is information from Harper's um, 18th, uh, 18th century, excuse me, 17th century Harper's Encyclopedia. And so I did make sure I didn't forget and pull that information up to share with the community as well uh, let me see yeah here it is right here uh, so i got that i also got some audio cast that i want to play and i also got some family here with me in at the conference table of truth welcome here brother currenton i love to have you here brother whenever you come here and join me here at the black village and also my nephew i appreciate you guys joining me here at the black village and if you want to chime in you have anything you want to share or comment on please do share your information or ask a question and i will other than that i will continue with the podcast okay last uh, delicious black sunday i didn't get a chance to share some information that i wanted to um share with the conscious community from harper's an 18 18 i think an 1830 matter of fact i'm gonna look at it right now because i've got the information right here uh huh Okay. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, yeah. This is Harper's Encyclopedia 
and actually this encyclopedia goes from 1915 all the way to 458 AD okay and so what I thought that was real important and caught my attention in Harper's encyclopedia is when it talks about the women um, the indigenous women okay um, during the uh, first contact and this is what Harper's uh, encyclopedia says about the indigenous women it said the women performed almost all the manual labor and burden bearing they carried on their limited agriculture which consisted of in production of maize corn indigenous corn beans squash potatoes and tobacco they manufactured these women did all this the women did all this they manufactured the implements of war and for hunting fishing made mats skins feathers clothing canoes canoes ornaments of, of teeth and claws and beasts and shells and porcupine quills performed all the domestic drudgery and constructed the lodges the women constructed the lodges the long oh wow um, of the of bark and trees excuse me they constructed the lodges of bark and trees the hides of beasts uh, rude figures of animate of animals and uh, inanimate objects carved into wood or stone and molded into clay and picture writing on inner barks of trees or skins of beasts and cut and cut upon rocks with rude or, uh, or, or ornamented pottery were the extent of their accomplishments. In the arts of design and literature, the picture writing was sometimes used in musical notation and contained the burden of their songs. That's what caught my attention. Let me reread this one more time, just that last sentence. The picture writing was sometimes used in musical notations and contained the burden of their songs. Now, anybody who knows anything about slave history, that right there should, should have caught their attention. Because what did the slaves do in the fields? They sang songs that had everything to do with their burden of slavery. They shared it in their songs. The people would be out in the fields, the women, and sometimes even the men, would start these songs that everybody was familiar with. And as they were picking the cotton, these songs would exemplify, would also magnify, and at the same time glorify, not glorify their oppression, but glorify their strength. That's the endurance through that oppression. You feel me? Listen to what the, the Wood Harper Dictionary says about the indigenous women. It said they 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 wrote their songs on they wrote this is picture writings and was sometimes used in musical notations that contained the burdens of their songs. That means as these women were doing hard work in the tribal communities, they sang songs that would help them get through the day, that would help them get through the day of their burden of hard work for their families as they went throughout the day working hard for their families. My goodness. That's a, that's a connection, people. That's a connection. That's not, that's not a connection that I'm trying to make. That is a cultural connection that stands out. That's a cultural connection that stands out. Come on now, white folks ain't got no rhythm. They can't sing, they can't dance, they got they they can't even jump, they can't even vibe to a beat without going messing going off. And then they wondering why they can't even catch up with the beat and the rhythm. When do you hear white folks creating songs of their burden as they did their hard work of oppression? Even when you hear about the white slaves of indentured servants, you didn't hear about them singing songs as they was going throughout their day doing their slavery work. No. You got white folks that was in slavery throughout the Greek period. You didn't hear about them writing songs of burdens. No. This is a cultural connection here in North America, and it's a connection to the slavery that went on amongst the, not only the indigenous people, but the indigenous people who lost their identity and didn't know who the hell they were and were told that they were Negro-colored African and black. Let me read that one more time before I continue my podcast from Harper's Encyclopedia from 1915 to 458 AD, talking about the indigenous women who did all the hard work in the tribal communities. The picture writing was sometimes used in musical notations and contained the burden of their songs. S O N G S. I'm not mistaken what I'm reading. 
So I will continue. Now, um, so that was something I want to share. Also, I wanted to share, and I want everybody to be mindful, anyone who's doing their research, doing research on indigenous people and their enslavement and connecting it to the so-called uh, African sl- enslavement. I said so-called. So as you, because when you do this research, starting all the way from 1492 all the way into the 15 and the 1600s, you're gonna see. You're gonna see there ain't no African people. They didn't even bring a high. They didn't even bring a high rate or high population of Africans here until the mid to the late 1700s. Go do your research. You'll see. The, <laughs> there's a big old gap of no Africans coming here. From from the from from the from the middle of the 1600s, all the way to the 1700s, when they just brought a little bit of some 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 Africans, and then you see, you know, a high rate of Africans not coming to North America until, or not even let alone North America, the Americas period, then uh, as well as North America until around the the late 1700s to the beginning of the 1800s. So who was all those people on the plantations from? 1430 all the way throughout the 1500s and throughout the 1600s who was those peoples on those plantations because Africans did not build plantations there is no historical record of Africans building plantations from the ground up a plantation has to be built has to be built you got to have the field got to be organized you got to have the master got to have his castle to live in you got to have the shacks for the slaves to live in you got to have a farm for the animals you got to have you got to have everything got to be the come on people do your research do your research okay um again I, last week I, co- I commented on the terminology of genocide which the white devil and his cronies and house negro pan-africanists play with that word genocide because genocide does not mean what the modern definition has been taught to people that's not the original meaning of genocide i'm going to read you the original definition of genocide right here okay and i'm also going to give you the modern definition of genocide now, the original Jeff definition of genocide coined by the individual who actually created the term and concept, which is Raphael Lemkin in 1944, who, yes, is a Jew <laughs> or was a Jew. Genocide is the deliberate systematic destruction in whole or in part, yes, in whole or in part of an ethnic, racial, religious or national group. Listen to what I just said, people. Genocide is the deliberate and systematic destruction in whole or in part. How can you in partly kill somebody? Somebody think about that. Most people, when they hear the word genocide, they think, oh, a whole ethnic group of people being killed because of their ethnicity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like they tell us about the Jews, but the Jews are still here, even though, you know, I don't even want to go into that. Rather, who the Jew people are, rather if they're real people are, or if they're really an ethnic race or whatever. That's a whole nother podcast or another discussion. But let me tell you, if the Jews were killed off, why are they still here? Because genocide does not mean to literally kill somebody off. So how can you kill somebody in part? That's the question right there, because it says. Genocide is the deliberate and systematic destruction in whole or in part. So how can you partly kill somebody? Oh, because the Jews are still here? So that's what that means? No, that doesn't even make sense. How can you partly kill somebody? You you either kill them or you don't. I'm going to tell you what this is talking about. I'm going to break down this white man's uh, definition and manipulation. The term was coined in 1944 by Raphael Lemkin. It is defined in Article 2. In the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide of 1948 and as any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national ethnic group or religious group as such killing members okay genocide can mean killing members of that group causing serious bodily harm or mental harm uh, to members of that group deliberately inflicting on the group's conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part imposing measures intended to prevent birth within this within the group or forcibly forcibly transferring children of the group into another group Ooh, did you hear what i just said folks 
go you can go look this up yourself go look up genocide coined in term by Raphael Lemkin his last name is Lemkin L-E-M-K-I-N he's the one who coined and created the term and concept and word genocide listen to this last part again that he that he what he what what genocide actually means deliberately inflicting on a group's on a group's condition of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part imposing measures intended to prevent birth births within the group forcibly transferring children of the group to another group that's cla- that's race reclassification that last part right now is talking about reclassifying identity reclassification again it says transferring children of the group to another group transferring the children of a group to another group as slavery and that's also identity reclassification that is talking about slavery to transfer the children of one group to another group I don't know why he said it like that that sounds so elementary but he should have just but see that's the white man he has to create words he has to pay attention to what he's saying how he say because he got his white brothers watching him and listening to him so it has to be said in such a way where they can manipulate things because he says transferring the children of the group to another group what do you mean transferring what do you mean trans what is that that's a manipulation right there what do you give freely take no it says forcibly forcibly transferring so that means force take by you don't have a choice but transferring to another group transferring what do you mean to another group what group what is this group okay let me go into more breaking down the terminology of genocide genocide of indigenous people let me break down that the genocide of this Raphael this is Raphael Lemkin these are his breakdown these are his words this is his this is his translation of what he created the genocide of, of, of indigenous people is the mass destruction of entire communities or races of indigenous people indigenous people are understood to be ethnic minorities who historically and current and current territories has become occupied by colonial expansion or the or the formation of a national state by a dominant political group such as colonial power while the concept of genocide was formulated by Raphael Lemkin in the mid 20th century he he, he, he the earlier expansion of various European colony colonial powers such as the Spanish and the British empires and the subsequent establishment of the national states on indigenous territory frequently involved acts of genocide violence against indigenous groups in the Americas, Australia, Africa, Asia. According to Lemkin, colonization was in itself instinctively, instinctively genocidal. He saw this genocide as a two-stage process, the first being the destruction of the indigenous population's way of life, taking away our identity, taking away our language, taking away our culture. Look what he said, and look what he said, the definition of genocide, and transferring it to another group. What did they do? They gave our culture to Mongoloid Indians. Mind you, we were here before them, our ancestors, and if somebody could say, no, not you, JC, you weren't here. No, my ancestors were here before Mongoloids were here. My ancestors, the Aboriginal indigenous people of North America called Paleo Black Amerindians. If you go do your research, go look up Paleo Amerindians and specifically look up Paleo Black Amerindians because these white devils play with their own information to hide it from us. We're on uncut like that here on the Black Village Community Podcast coming from straight from me. I'm going to give you the raw and uncut if you come here. If you listen to The Black Village, I'm going to give you the raw and uncut. So let me continue what Raphael Lincoln talks about when he breaks down genocide amongst the indigenous people. He goes on, according to David Mulberry Lewis, excuse me, let me go one up one. Okay, Raphael Lemkin, colonization was itself instinctively gen- genocidal. He saw this genocide as a two-stage process, the first being the destruction of the indigenous population's way of life. In the second stage, the newcomers imposed their way of life on the minority group. Again, in the second stage, the newcomers imposed their way of life on the minority group. So, this goes right back to last week. As I talked about how the white devil lied about our people 
dying from war and disease. Yes, many died from war. Many died from disease. But did all our people die from war and disease? Huh? No. Oh, wow, my. No, our people all did not die from war and disease. And my, excuse me, people, but my conference room had closed up. I had to reopen it. Okay, excuse me, I'm back. My conference room had closed up for a minute. <laughs> well, at least kicking me out. Now I'm back. So, no, people. Did all our people die from war and disease? As these white devils pose? No, they all didn't die from war and disease. Just like today when people get diseases. Prime example, one of the most terrifying man-made diseases, the Ebola virus. Did it wipe out Africa? No. Did it kill thousands? Yes. Did it kill hundreds? Yes. It even got to the U.S. briefly when it was when he came here, but it was stopped in its tracks. Now, Ebola is a man-made created virus. What about other minor diseases? You know, smallpox today is considered a minor disease because they have a cure for it but years ago they didn't have a cure for smallpox and I personally believe the white man was working on diseases way back during the 13th 12th century and, and even further back they were messing with biological warfare I proved that matter of fact let me go back to the article I read last week proving that the white man deliberately deliberately was no accident the so-called diseases that decimated and killed hundreds and even sometimes thousands of indigenous people during the 15th 16th century was deliberately and purposely done it was not an accident it was not just oh you know they shook hands with a white man and this white man didn't know he was carrying or carrier of a disease and he shook that indigenous person's hand and you know gave it to him and he got sick and then he gave it to the rest of his people and they got sick oh it was just a ran no 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 this was strategic this was planned this was military strategic this was this this was this was premeditated this was premeditated mass murder people I'm going to read it to you again, just like I read it last week. So any white devils you hear in this white devil, you're going to hear it again. Here we go again. And I'm going to read it to you. This is an excerpt from a history book called History Proof, uh, Historical Proof. Diseases was used as a weapon. Check it out. In the 18th century, the British fought France and his, and his Indian allies for possession of what was to become Canada during the French and Indian War of 1754 and 1763. At the end of the Pontiac Rebellion in 1763, 63, Sir Geoffrey Amherst, I'm going to say it again. At the Pontiac Rebellion in 1763, Sir Geoffrey Amherst, the commander-in-chief of the British forces in North America, wrote to Colonel Henry Banquet. He wrote to his commanding officer and he and this is what he said could it not be contrived to send smallpox among these disinfected tribes of indians we must use every strict stratagem in our power to reduce them the colonel replied i will try to inoculate the native americans with some blankets that may fall into their hands and take care not to get the disease myself smallpox decimated the Native Americans who had never been exposed to the disease before and had no immunity. Now, now that part is a lie. And they had no immunity. That is a lie. Again, the white man has to... I want you to know, I've read a lot of history books. Okay? I've read a lot of history books. I've read a lot of history books on Amer on, the, on uh, American history, on our indigenous ancestors, on the uh, Native Americans. I've read a lot of history. And I'm going to tell you, whenever they talk about the indigenous or Native American people, it doesn't matter if they tell a piece of the truth, a portion of the truth, a very minute, tiny bit of the truth, or if they straight lie, they always tell they have to mix some lies in with it. They can't tell all the truth. They have to tell either a total lie or a partial lie or somewhat of a lie. They have to bend the truth because it's all about feeding these white devils what they want to hear. Because I'm telling you right now, if you're breathing and you're talking, you got an immunity that's fighting against what's going on around you. The question is how strong is your defense against what's going on around you? How strong is your immunity? 
Now I'm finna break down and show you that this is not true with this white devil just said that they had no immunity. Now those who died didn't have an immunity to it. Their immunity obviously was weaker than those who continued to survive. Right here, Christopher Columbus. I read this too last week. I'm going to read this right quick again as, as well. Christopher Columbus, his letters to Queen Isabella. Qu Christopher Columbus was excited. In the name of the Holy Trinity, we can send from here all the slaves and Brazilian wood which, we could, which could be sold. He wrote to Ferdinand and Isabella in 1496 in Castel, Portugal of Aragon and the Canary Islands. They need many slaves. I do not think they can get enough. He viewed the Indian death rate optimistically. Although they die now, they will not always die. The Negroes and Canary Islands died at first. That means Columbus in 1492 understood, excuse me, in 1496, understood that some of them are going to die because some of them going to have a weaker immune system. But you know what? Not all of them will die because not everybody has the same type or same level of immunity or strength of in immunity when it comes to sickness you know no different than today no different than today people and when we have a, a, a an epidemic of flu or high epidemic of flu that hits this country some people get sick and die some people don't some people get very sick and they pull through some people don't get sick at all that's exactly how it was with our indigenous people now of course, obvious. It's very obvious. White folks was carrying a whole bunch of stuff, as well as they were intentionally inoculating, intentionally inserting, intentionally attacking our people from a biological warfare level as well. I just read that. But it's also obvious that they manipulate history because they still are doing everything in their power to hide who we are from us. Because the question is, why would they lie about this? Why would they lie about intentionally, purposely creating a biological warfare against the indigenous, pe in the indigenous people? It's not, it's not a popular narrative in history. They don't talk about it. They don't use the term that way back in, four, in, uh, in the, in the uh, early 16th and 15th century. Because this, um, this story I just read to you with this uh, British commander, this was in 17, um, 1754. So it's very obvious in the 16th, 15th, and the 17th, biological warfare was something that they were familiar with. But they don't talk about it in history today, people. Why? Why they hide it? Why they lie about it? Why they manipulate it? Even when it comes to the fact of how many indigenous people lived in, and died, constantly saying in their, in, as they pin things, as they try to erase us out of history, as they pin us out of history, they're constantly repeating the same political narrative that they died off from disease and warfare. But I just read you where Columbus said that wasn't true. Christopher Columbus wrote to Isabel, that's not true. Not all of them died from disease. Not all of them died from warfare. I've read also the, some of the wars, how they took our people and those who survived, the prisoners of wars, they shipped them off to the Canary Islands. They, 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 they enslaved them on plantations. They took the children and the women and kept them and made them house servants and made them field uh, servants to, to pick cotton and grow tobacco. The very communities that our people thrived in and built for their families, these white devils turned into plantations. Hernando de Soto built the first plantation on a tribal community. My goodness. Woo. Get me to preaching all day long. People, so <clears throat> let me continue this. And uh, as you guys know, my queen is not with me. My hardworking indigenous queen. And so I got her voice reading uh, from a book that I purchased titled We Are Not Just Africans, The Black Native Americans by Dr. Clyde Winters. And so Last week, I played a part of that. Now, I want to continue to play um, from this book and let you guys hear some of what Dr. Clyde Winters have to say about our indigenous ancestors. So I'm going to play that right now, and then I will continue my podcast subject matter, which is titled The, the European Invasion and Transatlantic Slave Myth Part 2. So we will be back right after this audio cast. Dr. Gates tested the DNA of other famous blacks and found that the only Afro-American celebrity to carry Native American DNA was Oprah Winfrey. Some people took this 
news as a joke and used it as evidence that DNA testing was not accurate because Winfrey, they thought, was too dark to be of Indian ancestry. These people were wrong. The vast majority of the Native Americans that formerly lived in the eastern and southeastern United States were black Native Americans with dark skin and kinky and straight hair. These black Indians carried the major Native American haplogroups, especially haplogroups R1 and X. Dr. Gates was hoodwinked. R1 is a Y chromosome haplogroup carried by Africans. Controversy surrounding the origin of the Y chromosome R lineages among Native Americans in the United States. Most researchers assume that the occurrence of this gene among Native Americans is the result of European admixture. There you go. Um, now, I should have probably played last week, so you could probably, if anybody who didn't get a didn't get a whiff of last week's audio cast. Of, um, of Dr. Clyde. That was an excerpt of Dr. Clyde talking about the R-clad um, gene that all uh, indigenous people carry and that the white man is constantly playing games with. And this is how he plays the games with the, with the, with the, um, with the DNA testing. And so I really didn't want to get into the DNA thing because that's, 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 going, that's going to take a little um, uh, me breaking down, breaking it down to simpler terms for people to comprehend it. But I would encourage anybody who don't have to go pick up uh, um, Dr. Clyde Winter's book um, the title, We Are Not Just Africans, The Black Native American. Um, because the book is very, 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 very informative if you want to know what's going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play what I did, what I played last week. So anyone who didn't hear it can hear it now. Um, the first excerpt from that chapter which my uh, wife is reading so I'm gonna play that right now we are not just Africans the black Native Americans by Clyde Winters chapter 1 black Native American DNA to ensure that black Native Americans would never be able to get their land back white Americans created the myth that the Native Americans were descendants of mongoloid people from East Asia this myth was solidified in the minds of people around the world through the export of American cowboy movies that always depicted Apache and other mongoloid Indians as the authentic Native Americans or Indians. Henry Louis Gates Jr. was told by his parents that he was of Native American ancestry, but he, when he took a DNA test, he discovered he belonged to haplogroup R1. Gates was told that this was a haplogroup of Europeans, so he proudly declared that he was white. Okay, now that's what I played last week. Again, now anybody who might be wondering, you know, Dr. Gates said he was white because, he, you know, you just said that, you know, the R haplogroup is something that's indigenous. No, you got to, I would encourage anybody to go get, I would encourage, go get Dr. Clyde's book. You'll see that you have to understand these terminologies of R clad one, R clad two, R clad arm, t uh, R clad one, two M, and you will see what's going on, because the R clad gene, the R clad, every R clad doesn't matter if it's R clad one, R clad two, R clad, R -clad M one two, it doesn't matter. All the R clads are, uh, are originate, originate with indigenous black people. The R clad originates. Now the question is, how did white people get that clad? Well, I want you to know that the R clad that white people have is not maternal. It is paternal. And again, you would have to understand this terminology, paternal and maternal. Maternal means that the R clad that is, that's amongst indigenous people, indigenous black people, indigenous Indians, indigenous Amer Amerindians of North America, of North America, the R clad that we have is maternal, meaning it's mitochondria maternal, meaning it starts with us. It means it, be it began with us. But the R clad that's amongst Europeans, that's claiming that they're Native American, does not originate with them. It's paternal, not maternal. Meaning that what they got was given to them, came from us, didn't originate with them. White people are not original. <laughs> Bottom line. 
And for you to understand or comprehend what I'm saying, you would have to read it yourself, research it yourself. You have to research geno, research DNA, research mitochondria DNA, research uh, genetic roots. Research it yourself. Because I can talk about it all day long and you won't, you might not even know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> so, but I know what the hell I'm talking about. I've researched it. I've studied it. And, uh, you know, and I'm not just studying Dr. Clyde. I study a number, number of different researchers and I come to my own conclusion because I'm adult intelligent enough to see what two plus two is four and you can't get five from three. <laughs> so I have enough intelligence to break things down. And I'm pretty sure anybody out there who's looking for truth have enough intelligence that they know what they see when they see truth. They comprehend they know they know how to comprehend it, they know how to marinate on it, they know how to process it, and they know how to see the truth. So on that note, I thought that was important to share. Again, I'm gonna say it again. The R clad gene does not originate with white people. So these white folks claiming that they're Indian with white skin, claiming they're Cherokee, claiming they're claiming that they're Choctaw. These white people claim who've taken our heritage, who, who did a role reversal. These white folks who've, who've, who've uh, bred themselves into the mongoloid ethnic group. And the mongoloid ethnic group have some of our blood in them. That's why you got some Apache Indians that look so dark. That's why you have Comanche Indians that look so dark. These are Plains Indians. Plains Indians are mongoloid Indians. The TP Indians are mongoloid Indians, people. You feel me? Do your research. But... You gotta realize the Mongoloid Indians came over here 12,000 years ago. They came when they got here. They came here to a land that was populated with black folks. They came, and, and a lot of those Mongoloid Indians made families, made communities, and made tribes with the indigenous inhabitants. Again, that's how the Comanche got dark skin. The Lakota, you got some Lakota, you got some light skinned Lakotas, you got some Lakotas that look almost white, but then you got some Lakotas that look darker than me. I mean, I'm pretty sure you don't know how dark I am, but I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm what you might call a, there's a lot of, you know, um, I don't know what you, I guess I'm a, a penny. I'm a, I'm a, what do you call it? A, a copper color brown. I'm copper color. <laughs> so on that note, I have another audio cast that I want to play, but I also got some information I want to read as well. I got some information I want to break down. Yesterday, uh, last week I was breaking down this war tactic. Okay. The war tactic. I started with one. The first part of European invasion. All right, let me read to you my notes. First, we must comprehend and be mindful that we that there were four main types of forms of warfare in the beginning and during the European invasion. Number one, the first type of form of warfare. The first type of warfare being the fictitious diplomacy in the form of friendship. You know, coming over here, you know, that, that game they constantly tell our kids in school. They sat down during Thanksgiving and ate Thanksgiving food. Lie. <laughs> okay, so the first form is the is the fictitious diplomacy in the form of friendship when their true intentions were to take over and, and invade at any means necessary, even if it meant war. But that but that first contact and encounter was was a war. It was a war. It was war. It was a war. When they first contact our ancestors, their intention was I'm taking this. They just don't know I'm taking this. Okay, so that first contact was a war. The first modern biological germ and infectious disease warfare against indigenous peoples. That's what it was. Okay, the second form type of war was due to the spoils of war, captives of war, which was the physical bondage through perpetual and permanent enslavement, which was done through their system or chaotic corrupt laws and their enforcement, their law enforcement or law enforcers like the slave patrols and all that. That's the second type of war, okay? The third type of war these white devils did was a reconditioning form of mental slavery, which was to reinforce by, the, by, by that first physical bondage of war, the indoctrination and practice of chattel slavery. That's the second type of war. And the mental, in, in bond, the mental bondage, you feel? They got you physically in bond, you know that, but now your mind must be reconditioned. That's that second type of war. You feel me? The the chattel enslavement, as um, which is psychological warfare. This entails the reprogramming 
and brainwashing through forced means of enslavement. For example, but not limited to the changing of one's name and a simulation of a person into a forced slave labor or a forced way of living, removing their removing their cultural without choice. You feel me? This was this was done to our people. Okay, now the fourth, the fourth way. This is the final. The fourth warfare, which was the final nail in the coffin, cultural coffin. Okay, the mental psychological form of genocide that was done through indoctrination of chattel slavery. We now have still today a cultural genocide. We have paper genocide that was done to our people, our grandparents, our great grandparents, which was to, def which was to, which was, <clears throat> excuse me, which only depended on, which was only, excuse me, which was only deepened by the amnesia and the abyss of loss of identity. That was the last thing they did, the paper genocide. The paper genocide. By the time our people was free from slavery, they had been, they had been so many generations and so many generations and so many generations of people, families and children and women and men, cousins, nieces, uncles, aunts, that had been living in a condition of slavery to the point that their minds were conditioned. Their minds were conditioned. They couldn't read. They couldn't write. They didn't know who they were because they were told who they were. Their mama was told who they were. Their grandmama was told who they were. Their uncles were told who they were. So this type of system and perpetual of mind enslavement carried on even after our people was free. And they still were living in a state of fear even during the time that they were free. Come on, people. Because the white people, the Ku Klux Klan, rose to the occasion around uh, right after, I believe, right after um, 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 1865. You feel me? And so now they, you know, now our people is free and they're, and they're freed in a system of, 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 of Jim Crow, that, you know, which at the time Jim Crow wouldn't even, didn't even have a name for it, but it was still a system of Jim Crow before they even gave it the name Jim Crow. They still, people, black folks couldn't go where they wanted to go. They couldn't do what they wanted to do, even if they, even though they were free. They couldn't read, they couldn't write, they couldn't get a job. The only thing they knew was what they were taught to do on the plantation. That's why many of them went right back and did sharecropping. That's why many of them went right back. Left, didn't know what to do when they went, and didn't only, because the only thing they knew is where they were at, where they were raised, where their parents were raised and grandparents were raised on the plantation. They didn't educate our people. They didn't aid our people in anything. They wouldn't, they couldn't go to the reservations because they had locked that up in political legality, making it where the, 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 the mongoloid Indian wouldn't take black people because many of the black people on the reservation at that time had to leave due to the Dawes, Rose List, and other political legalities that they were trying to force black folks off the reservation. Now, many of them stayed and wouldn't leave. Many of them stayed. I'm going to give you, matter of fact, I'm going to let you check out our audio cast, speaking to what I'm talking about, about black folks in the 18th century on the reservation. And I'm going to tell this is um, Don Chia. Don Chia, the, the brother who plays, um, who, uh, who plays the sidekick on Iron Man. You know, the black brother who's in the military and Iron Man in the movie. That's Don Chia. Most people don't know John Don Chia is Chickasaw. He's Chickasaw Indian. Well, check this out. I'm going to play this audio cast with the speaking to what I'm talking about. This paper genocide these white devils are still doing today. They ain't changed. Their agenda is still the same. To keep us with no identity. To keep us with without a cultural identity and, and, and other than what they want us to have which is this false construct of an African identity when that don't even make any fucking sense how are you going to be African if you're not from Africa basically pushing to the side in people's minds that cultural identity don't mean a damn thing only what they say because the, and, the, and the genetic thing they're manipulating 
That's why I tell people, do your own research on the on the genetic thing. Don't be taking FamilyTree.com for verbatim. Don't be taking 23andMe for verbatim. These white devils don't want to tell, don't want you to know. They're going to tell you from West Africa. They they tell a white person they from West Africa. You got white people in Africa will tell you they African. Of course they are. They created the goddamn artificial construct of the word Africa. That's not even the official name of that continent labeled by its indigenous people. Let me play this audio cast right quick before I get to preaching. Hold on to it. Check this out. Oh, wait, and let me go back. I thought I had it in my dashboard. I don't even have it in my dashboard. Let me put this in my dashboard so you can check this out. Um, again, black folks need to do their research. We must do our research, people. You don't do your research, the system is going to tell you who you are. Now, I'm, I'm trying to uh, pass some time because I thought I had it in my dashboard. Here it is right here. Here we go. Check this out. By This is Don Chia, and you get a chance to hear. Check this out. The United States government didn't make a treaty with the Chickasaw until 1866, forcing them to liberate their slaves and make them citizens. The Chickasaws freed their slaves, but they did not, they did not offer them citizenship in the Chickasaw Nation. These honorary white people, I mean, what's going on here? Don, your ancestors were in Indian territory, yet they were neither Chickasaw nor were they Americans. They were a people without a country and without any legal status at all. That's crazy. Okay, people. I just had to pause it at that. I just had to pause it. You heard. He said that Don Chia's family, Don Chia's grandmother and grandfather and great-grandmother and great-grandfather were slaves to the Chickasaw people. I've read the history of the Chickasaw people. I've read the history. I got the information. I got a book right now on the, on the five tribal, so-called civilized tribe, tribal nations. And the Chickasaw did not treat their slaves like slaves. It was only the word slave was only on paper. It was only on paper. So the Chickasaw did not treat their people like slaves. Matter of fact, they married those black folks. They intermarried with them. Okay. So he said during a time. This, now he's not giving a date so I'm going to give a date this time was after black folks was free from slavery okay and I'm most likely um, uh, uh, house negro Lewis Gates is not giving a date for a reason because he don't want nobody researching this but you can go research it yourself during the time of when black people was free, free from slavery and 1870 so called during the naturalization act they wanted black folks to become african-american they wanted black people to become a citizen you had to become an african-american you had to agree with the naturalization act you had to sign that so at this time the u.s government is forcing the five tribes not only to let black folks go because they're not slaves no more but also they, they're trying to force them off of the reservation for a reason so check this out and listen to the rest of this Crazy. The Chickasaw freedmen would spend decades in this stateless limbo, invisible and forgotten. By the time the century drew to a close, the United States government had turned its back on our people all over the South. But out West, where the Chickasaw freedmen had been living as stateless people for over 30 years, the status of Indian territory was about to change. In the late 1890s, the United States government drew up official roles of the citizens and former slaves of the Native American nations. Don Cheadle's ancestors were among those who were ready to stand up and be counted. Your great-great-grandparents would have had to travel to Tishomingo, the capital of the Chickasaw Nation in order to enroll. But it was a last chance for former slaves like your ancestors to claim Chickasaw identity. 
This is the land allotment records for Johnston County, Oklahoma. Mary Kemp, Henderson Cheadle. Again, I had to pause that. You hear what he just said. This was an opportunity for his family to claim their identity as Chickasaw, as Chickasaw indigenous people. Now, <laughs> I want you to know when you <laughs> I've watched the whole video. This is an actual video anybody can go look up on YouTube. For 30 years, Don Chia's family and his, not only his family, this is this was done to all black people. Black people who were on the reservations, who were enslaved, so-called enslaved by the five civilized tribes because the five civilized tribes included the Cherokee, um, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, um, the Seminole, and um, another one, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the, um, um, the Seminole, and I believe the Cree. Okay, but it was it was five of them. Uh, they did not treat their people like slaves. They were not in bondage. They were not beating them with webs. They were not making them pick cotton. It wasn't going on like that, like most people think they were doing. It didn't happen. I think there's only one tribe that did it. I believe it was the. I'm, I can, I'm not sure, but either way it go. My point is this: is that after black folks were free from slavery, after um, 1870 to 1880, black folks had no so-called citizenship in this country. Yet we are born here. Yet we, our ancestors, built this country with their blood, sweat, and tears. And these white devils want to say they had no identity. They had no citizenship because of their corrupt legality and laws that they were trying to manipulative create to keep a hold on this land. That sounds ludicrous. So as you heard, his family had to go to the head Chickasaw Nation and claim their identity as Chickasaw Indians. You heard it, okay? I'm going to rewind this a little bit and we're going to continue listening to it. We're among those who were ready to stand up and be counted. Your great great grandparents would have had to travel to Tishomingo, the capital of the Chickasaw Nation, in order to enroll. But it was a last chance for former slaves like your ancestors to claim Chickasaw identity. This is the land allotment records. For Johnston County, Oklahoma. Mary Kemp. Henderson Cheadle. So they got some land. And the number of acres? 40. <laughs> <laughs> the fabled 40. 40 acres of land given to them free and clear by their former slaveholders. I had to pause it again, people. You heard what his family got. They got 40 acres. Wait a minute, that kind of sounds like that 40 acres and a mule thing, huh? That after the Civil War, they promised slaves 40 acres and a mule, all those who was willing to fight for their freedom. But I thought we Africans, huh? You see, Don Cheadle's family had to travel to the Chickasaw capital, to their to the Chickasaw nation. They had to, they, after they were kicked out, they had to travel back and go to the Chickasaw headquarters. To make sure they claim their identity as Chickasaw. And in the process, they got 40 acres. I wonder if they got a mule too. Maybe I wonder if that white I wonder if that house Negro Lewis Gates left that out. That they maybe got a mule in the process too. 40 acres and a mule. Because I'm wondering that number 40 acres right there is really pertinent into what's being said right here, people. So let's continue this. But can you imagine what this meant to your ancestors? That's huge. That's economic freedom if you can farm it and work it and use it. Yeah. Don, your ancestors suffered for decades as a people with no status at all. Yet in the end, they received something that other African Americans, as you know, only dreamed about. They're 40 acres. The vaunted 40 acres. There it is. And right down there where your ancestors had their homesteads, you can see the town of Wiley, Oklahoma. Yeah. Now, Wiley was one of the all-black towns founded by former slaves. So the whole town was freed slaves? Whole town, all black. 
Still, can you imagine what it was like for your ancestors to live through slavery, finally get freed, then be stateless for 30 years, and then find themselves suddenly landowners yeah. and landowners in an all-black town? Yeah, amazing. It must have felt like finally, finally. You know, free at last, for real. There you go, people. That was a little vi- uh, audio footage of uh, Don Chia. Don Chia, the brother who plays uh, the sidekick in Iron Man. You know, he wears that extra Iron Man suit. He's the, you know, that's you know Iron Man's black homie. Yeah, that's Don Chia, who found out that he is Chickasaw. He's a Chickasaw. He's Chickasaw Indian. Huh? Huh? Why Louis Gates running around saying black folks ain't Indian? Don Chia found out his ancestors were not only owned by the Chickasaw Nation, but they are Chickasaw. White man tried to play the devil to keep them from getting their identity, but they went and got their identity. They went down into the they went down into the head Chickasaw Nation, claimed their identity, and got 40 acres. But what did you hear Louis Gates call them? Africans. He called them African Americans. Huh? How you gonna be African and be an Indian? Africans live in Africa. Africans know the African. Africans speak African, speak their African language. Huh? Africans have an African culture. Africans have an African identity. Africans know the African family and extended family members. Africans come here, visit, sometimes they stay, sometimes they make families, but they still know they're African. (laughs) How can Don Chia's family be African and Chickasaw? and claim Chickasaw identity and get 40 acres in the process unless they were what? Chickasaw wake up black people wake up before I go I must play this you go to a reservation you see poverty you see churches and you see liquor stores when you go to any hood you see poverty you see churches and you see liquor stores so what make you think you're not on a reservation and in order to make us not rebel crazily they made us think we was from somewhere else and in order to make us not rebel crazily they made us think we was from somewhere else white americans created the myth that the native americans were descendants of mongols of mongols of mongols people from east asia nigga from here want to take this shit off african just want to go home Nigga from here want to take this shit over. People, we must be mindful of that. We must be mindful of that. We must be mindful. We must claim our true identity. We must stop claiming something that is not true, is not who we are. All we have to do is talk to our grandparents, talk to our great grandparents. You ain't got no grandparents and great grandparents around. They pass away. They move to the next level of life. We didn't talk to your aunties, talk to your mama, talk to your uncles. Talk to your cousins. You don't know anybody? Then you know what? Do some research on the indigenous people of North America. Do some research on the enslavement of the indigenous people of North America. You can do something. You can find out who you are and not claim something that the system is trying to tell you, dictating who you are. You claim who you are. So, on that note, my time is ticking down. And I want to ask my brothers, is there anything, anybody comments, anybody want to say due to what I've already displayed and disseminated to the community? Nephew, Brother Currington, you guys sitting here at the Conscious Table of Truth, anything you guys want to share or ask? Well, I just want to say that uh, it was a good podcast. And uh, I'm that have been more and more amazing trickery that they have, that they have portrayed upon our people. Uh, yep, that's true. And they won't stop with the games. Yeah. They won't stop with the games, but it's up for us to find out the truth. Truth is a treasure. Nephew, you got any words, nephew? I don't, I don't really have too much to say, but uh, it was a good, you know, good podcast and uh, some good information that you know, I learned. Uh, I really like, I really like the, the, the podcast. Yeah. Well, I appreciate my family joining me, Brother Currington, my nephew. I appreciate you guys joining me here 
at the Black Village Community Podcast. And as always, I am here every Sunday, unless unless I'm doing a study. You feel me? Unless I'm doing a study, I'm here every Sunday from four, excuse me, from three to four Pacific Standard Time, West Coast. You feel me? I'm here out here in the West Coast of Cali. So from three to four p.m. Pacific Standard Time, dropping nothing but the raw and uncut here on the Black Village Community Podcast. And you can join me. Doesn't cost you a dime. Just a bit of your conscious time. And I'm really also, uh, come on, I'm calling, I'm calling on the conscious Pan-African brothers. Come, come and talk to me. You brothers, if I'm saying something wrong, if I'm saying something, I'm spreading something that's untrue, then then please, I'm calling out to all you Pan-African house Negroes, all you Pan-African scholars. Yes, you know who you are. And I'm calling you to come, come and talk to a brother. Let's have a conscious. Let's sit down at the conscious table of truth and put the information out and let the evidence speak for itself. You feel me? But I know you guys ain't going to take me up on the challenge. So you're just going to talk to your house Negroes who think like you. And you're going to talk to the ones who don't know because they ain't there yet. But don't worry. When they get there, they're going to realize the truth. Because I'm going to be right there dropping the raw and uncut as always here on the Black Village Community Podcast. And this is yours truly, your storm of consciousness. Your storm of consciousness, JC, a.k.a. Afro Black. You feel me? And so... I got to end my show, but you know, it's hard for me to end the show. It's hard for me to end the show when I really enjoy dropping nothing but the raw and uncut. You feel me? I just really enjoy doing this. Our forefathers weren't the pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. You heard him. You heard, you heard what Malcolm said. Go ahead, say it again, Malcolm. Our forefathers weren't the pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. So, just like that. You feel me? So, I gotta go. I will be back next Delicious Black Sunday, dropping nothing but the raw and uncut. I, I'm, I, look, I'm doing some deep research. I'm doing some serious research. So I got some research. I got, I got a podcast that, that's gonna come up the week after next that's gonna drop the hammer on everything. You feel me? Because I'm a researcher. As long as I got breath, as long as I got life, which life is something that never ends, me even if it ends on this plane, it continues, and the energy continues, and the voice of our people continue to speak through the voices and through the bodies of anyone who embraces truth. You feel me? And so the voice and the cries of our people will continue. The truth will prevail. You feel me? The white devils cannot stop it. No matter how much they do, no matter what they try, it won't stop. You feel me? And so I will be back. I will be black. And black doesn't have anything to do with Africa. Black is an adjective, people. So all my indigenous people tripping off the term black, wake the hell up. Stop tripping. I talk. You you come on my show, too. Huh? My indigenous brothers and sisters who got a problem with the term black. Come on my show and talk to me about it. But I know you're not going to do that either. Call me. Just call me privately. I got a private number. You can call me. 916 uh, 572 7446. Call my business line. Call me. It ain't gonna cost you a dime. Call my number. Well, you know what? If the, that probably would cost you if because it, it's a long distance number. Make, hey, make the call on me 916 572 7446. Call my business line. My indigenous brothers and sisters who run from the term black, which is an adjective meaning that it doesn't mean anything unless you put a noun with it to describe what you're talking about. I got these indigenous house Negroes tripping off of the term black, refusing to unite with people of like-minded people. You feel me? But you know it ain't going to stop it. The great mother is doing the work and awakening her people. So on that note, I got to go. And I will be back and I will be black next delicious black Sunday, dropping nothing but the raw and uncut here on the Black Village Community Podcast. You can always join me. You feel me? All my indigenous brothers and sisters, much love. And your cokey. Peace. I gotta go. I'm out.